learned all about energy efficiency because I thought I was going to be the sort of pariah here and, uh, and talk about how that's not necessarily the most important thing um, in my practice anyway. Um, what I want to do is uh, take a look at uh, the notion of uh, the embodied carbon in our buildings and the, this slide of the alleyway I think is sort of in, indicative of not just our approach in the building world, but a, a very sort of Western approach to thinking about things, which is to latch on to one idea that seems like a good idea, that's very simple and direct and, and uh, unidirectional, and, and follow that path to the exclusion of, of everything else. And I think that in some ways we've done that in the building industry by focusing uh, so uh, intently on energy efficiency, and uh, that there are some really unintended consequences that come along with that. So I have been a, a sort of self-professed green builder for 20 plus years. Um, don't get me wrong, I think energy efficient buildings are really important. Um, but I think that there's a whole host of criteria that make for a really good building, such as all the well stuff we just looked at, um, the things that, that the living building challenge embodies um, that go beyond energy efficiency. And that quite often there's a danger that the extremely energy efficient building actually compromises on, on a lot of the other criteria uh, that are really important. So um, the building code itself uh, addresses these criteria that, that I'm talking about. It doesn't do a very good job of following up on them. Um, but our building code um, you know, says that, that occupant health is important. That's one of the seven objectives of the code. Um, that uh, resource depletion is uh, one of those uh, objectives, and that um, the natural environment is another one of those objectives. So this isn't um, even living building challenge. It's, this isn't sort of like far out stuff. This is stuff that the building code has had in it since 2006. Um, you won't find any reference to any of these things beyond the opening objective section of the building code. Um, but I think it does point to the fact that, that these things are, uh, are really important too. And uh, in particular, uh, I'm going to address the, the last one. Um, and it, it does, in Ontario anyway, specifically call out greenhouse gas emissions as something that the built environment should not be responsible for um, producing uh, in excess, which I think we're doing. So uh, in, our, in our own practice, uh, we sort of have a, our own kind of criteria matrix, I guess similar to other rating systems, where we look at um, all of these things as being equally important. Um, but for uh, tonight, I'm going to uh, particularly pull on the, uh, the embodied carbon stuff. Partly because, um, and I'll show you towards the end of the presentation, what we found is that if we do buildings that excel at reducing embodied carbon, we seem to automatically do buildings that do really well at most of these other criteria. So in pursuing that one objective, we actually uh, overlap with many of the others. So I think um, I'm unlikely to be talking in front of a room of climate change skeptics, um, but um, I happen to think that it's a problem. And there are two ways that, that the built environment contributes to it. One is through the operational missions, and I think you know, we're all very aware of how that works, that the, the, the energy used to heat and cool our buildings has um, uh, emissions associated with it. And you know, depends whose numbers you look at, but 20, 30, 40% of uh, the world's emissions are from that. I am really got really interested in uh, embodied emissions. Uh, I came across the notion when um, the, um, the ICE database, the Inventory of Carbon and Energy, came out from the University of Bath in 2008, and it was the first time I'd seen a whole whack of building materials all listed together that had gone through a fairly rigorous uh, approach uh, to come up with numbers, and I looked at the numbers and I thought, I should add these up for one of our buildings, and I did, and it was really surprising, uh, some of the answers I got. And uh, since then, I've been pursuing it uh, pretty thoroughly, and in fact, I'm currently a, a master's student at Trent University uh, doing my thesis on this work. Um, so it's been a little bit, um, you know, I'm into this right now. <laughs> um, so what, what I want to show you, these two graphs come from Architecture 2030. And they began as, a, as, a, as an organization highly motivated by uh, energy efficiency. And they very quickly realized that the embodied carbon emissions, those emissions that come from uh, harvesting, manufacturing, and transporting building materials 
are in some ways even a larger problem than the operational missions. And these two charts are a way of sort of showing that. So this is their graph of a sort of typical high performance, so good energy efficient commercial building. And the yellow bar is showing that on day one, when that building has been created, 60% of its overall emissions uh, for its 100 year lifespan have already occurred in the form of emissions associated with the building materials. So regardless of what that energy um, uh, triangle on top of that graph does, 60% of what that building will emit over 100 years is already done. So that makes it a, a highly relevant uh, chunk. And if you look at the, at the graph on the right, what they're showing is that um, between 2015 and 2050, when a building is built in 2015, if it's relatively energy efficient, by 2050, still 90% of its emissions will be embodied in the materials and not coming from its operational emissions. So in other words, if we want to do something about climate change, we're much better off paying attention to that 90% than we are to the 10%. If you want to have a real effect, taking the 10% down to 1% is a lot less than knocking the 90 down to 50. So what I've been doing at Trent is basically modeling buildings. Um, currently, I'm working on some larger buildings, some multi-unit buildings. This is a single-family residence, a fairly small one, a thousand square foot sort of little home. And again, my graph sort of mimics what um, uh, you saw on the other graphs. The orange bar is the feedback here is the um, is the uh, the embodied carbon emissions. So this first house is a pretty standard. This is what people build to code. This is stud framing, fiberglass insulation into styrofoam on the outside, um, fiberglass in the ceiling, vinyl siding, like pretty typical stuff. And you'll see that it's got about uh, 20 tons of embodied carbon. So on day one, uh, it's already emitted 20 tons. And if you heat it with natural gas, by 2050, um, it's gotten up to about 85 tons. So we are right that the, um, the, the energy component is a significant component, um, but the, the embodied is fairly large. This next graph um, shocked me so much that I went back and did the math three times and then I had colleagues do the math <laughs> with me uh, to make sure that I was seeing this properly and, uh, and in the end everybody's like, yep, you got this right. This is a, an all foam high performance house um, where the embodied carbon energy, so this is uh, two by six studs um, with spray foam in them, and then um, uh, an inch of, um, of sheet foam on the outside, uh, spray foam in the ceiling, spray foam, sort of spray foamed all around, I guess. And, and you can see that on day one, it's over 90 tons of emissions uh, before the house has, has done anything. And so we've done a great job of narrowing that red slice, but uh, at the expense of the orange slice, and if you notice at the end, the code-built house um, it has emitted less in operational and embodied than this uh, foam house has done just in, in uh, embodied emissions on day one. So if the builder or designer of this house thought, I'm going to do something about climate change, I'm going to make a super energy efficient house, they blew it. <laughs> because on day one, they've already out-emitted the next door neighbor straight up code home. Um, and I think that's shocking to me. This last home is uh, sort of reflective of what we do in Endeavor. Some people call it natural building. I now call it uh, carbon neutral building or uh, uh, carbon negative building, although it's positive, so it shouldn't be negative. <laughs> you can see what happens here is that um, the embodied carbon emissions of that building are below the zero line. How do we do that? We do that by building with plants. Uh, plants are the original and still the best uh, carbon capture and storage devices uh, on the planet. There's a lot of money and effort and science going into making machines that pull carbon out of the atmosphere and do something with it, and plants do that all the time. So this is things like straw, this is things like hemp, cellulose insulation, um, wood fiber board, all these kinds of materials. So we start below the line, and we have the exact same energy efficiency as this house, but we don't even cross into emissions territory until 2030, and we're barely uh, emitting by the end of 2050. Thank you. <laughs>
So that was interesting. Next, the same house gets modeled using a heat pump, um, an air source heat pump, using the Ontario grid carbon intensity right now. And look at that, it's the same amount of embodied emissions, and look what happens to the operational emissions. <laughs> we didn't make the house any more energy efficient, we just put a cleaner heating system on it, and boom, this thing is now a really decently performing building from the point of view uh, of the climate. Our friend the foam house, you can't even see the red line barely, so we've done a great job of, of taking that out, but it's still a bit of an elephant. It's still sitting there uh, at 90 tons of emissions before the key's been turned, and you know it's now almost triple what the code house is, and all we did was change the, um, uh, change the heating system. And then here's our, our, uh, our carbon negative building. It's still a, a net carbon sequesterer by 2050, and when I project that line out, it's somewhere around uh, 2200 that <laughs> it becomes a carbon emitter. Hopefully our grid is clean by then and it may not be an emitter at all. But this is, a, this is a radical difference. This is buildings going from being, any of these top buildings are still, even if they're really energy efficient, a climate problem, and suddenly, poof, we've got something that's taking CO2 out of the atmosphere and putting it away. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a climate change uh, reverser. Um, and so this graph, this is a very not interesting graph to look at because you can hardly see anything on it. But what I wanted to do here was model, well, okay, I get that not everybody's going to build straw bale and hempcrete buildings and, and do the kinds of things we do. What if I model a building with all the best low-carbon, off-the-shelf materials? So we're talking, this building has, um, still has a concrete foundation, uh, but it has, you know, a, a low cement mix in it. Um, it's got things like cellulose insulation in the walls. It's got wood fiberboard as the insulated sheathing, like basic, basic stuff. And there it is, with a heat pump, this building that any builder could build right now today without really changing their practice, like just nailing on different stuff and pumping different things into the walls. This thing still has vinyl siding, like it's not, this is not super eco building, but from the point of view of the climate, it's still carbon negative until 2050. I mean, that's pretty amazing that, that you know, without a huge change in our practice, we can get that far, make that much of a radical shift uh, in what we do. And just for interest sake, I took the amount of uh, single, family, family, single family residential building uh, that we did in North America in 2016. I multiplied the emissions out by that high carbon one, and it's about 130 million tons in a year for the new construction that we do if we built it all that way. Or if we did it on that last graph as, as we would, like a, not the, the supernatural building, but just the good off-the-shelf climate stuff, we'd actually sequester almost 8 million tons. The difference between those two things is the equivalent of taking 38 coal-fired power plants offline. Poof, climate change <laughs> like, impacted greatly. Like when Ontario took our three uh, coal-fired power plants, four, whatever it is, offline, that was the single biggest impact that we made on carbon reductions, and we could times that by 10 simply by changing the materials that we're building with and not so much the energy efficiency of them. I'm going to go fast through this because I want to get to the end. What are these carbon storing materials? They're plant-based materials. Um, lots of them come from the waste stream. Um, so things like cellulose, things like wood fiber board, waste textiles, hemp, straw, um, rice hulls, coconut palm kernel, um, all these things. We don't even have to grow them uh, specially they already exist on the planet. Just to give some perspective, over two billion tons of grain straw are grown on the planet annually. There's as much carbon in the straw from that two billion tons of grain straw to completely negate all transportation emissions on the planet annually. So <laughs> we already plant these plants that absorb all the CO2 that our transportation puts out, plus some. Um, we do it, we plant it, we harvest it, and then we either burn it or let it molder in the field so it goes back into the atmosphere as CO2. If we can bundle this and put it into buildings, we make a, a significant, like a really significant impact uh, on climate change. And that's just the straw part, that's not even looking at these uh, other opportunities. 
Also, interesting things going on with um, even better carbon storing materials where um, we even get rid of the emissions that are associated with going out and doing things like planting uh, grain, um, growing uh, microfoam in place. We did uh, these really cool panels where we, we grew mycelium insulation uh, as the exterior insulation. Biomason, who are doing micro grown bricks um, as strong as concrete, um, grown, no heat, no emissions, and actually carbon sequestering. Places that are taking carbon emissions out of um, smokestacks and turning it into aggregate. So there's all kinds of really interesting stuff uh, that happens um, and could be happening to make this even better picture. I'm going to skip through this really quickly because uh, Bettina touched on this stuff really well. Um, I'm going to skip that. I'm going to skip that. I'm not going to skip this. <laughs> Very quickly, I'm just going to say that fighting climate change, which is the use of fossil fuels, which is the extraction of oil, the burning of oil, to try to use that as a climate solution is a really backwards approach. Um, it's backwards um, in so many ways, but even if you don't think about it from a climate change point of view, it's backwards from a health point of view. Uh, the fire retardants that make foam insulation possible to use in buildings are atrocious chemicals. We should feel highly uh, responsible uh, for the fact that these things show up in breast milk in, in women across the planet, even in places where they don't use these chemicals. Um, the association of, of these things with foam uh, is atrocious. Plus, we're supporting the oil industry that's not changing the climate, so um, I would encourage you to not do that. This graph, um, don't worry about reading it, but these are what my models look like when I'm figuring out the embodied carbon of buildings. This is that conventional, uh, high, or a version of a conventional sort of high performance home. That's the, uh, the sort of uh, conventional low carbon thing. And all I did was highlight in red, um, red list chemical containing materials, and highlighted in purple materials where there is some high amount of environmental degradation involved with the harvesting of that material. This is what I meant by the fact that when I make a building that's better for the climate, I seem to automatically make a building that's better for people and better for the environment. There's a lot of red and purple here. There's basically none over there. And so I think this is a really good lens for being able to look at how to hit these other goals while also addressing climate change, which is a pretty meta goal. Thank you for the warning. Just really quickly, um, just so you know that these things aren't kind of pie in the sky, uh, the kinds of buildings we do at Endeavor and that Fourth Pig and other people do. Um, Here's a building that stores 40 tons of CO2 in its, in its construction materials. Um, and a bunch of other targets we tried to hit, make it affordable, have no toxic materials in the building, do a lot of renewable energy production, keep the harvesting and manufacturing materials local, and don't contribute to waste. And so that's a residential project. This is an office building project, uh, managed to be um, uh, net positive on its energy, same kind of things. This thing's a carbon storing monster, 63 tons in a 2,400 square foot building. Um, if we reproduce that, uh, that makes a big dent in the, in the climate change really uh, quickly. And our project last year, um, trying to take these types of materials and make them uh, modular. So this is a building that we uh, built in Peterborough, took down, rebuilt in Toronto at the edit show last fall, and then took down and rebuilt on a client site. So fully modular, um, designed by uh, the um, architecture program at Ryerson. Same kinds of things, 24 tons of carbon storage in this little 1,000 uh, square foot building or 1,100 square foot building. And again, similar targets around energy production, waste, and, and local economy. And just to wrap up, um, if we think about buildings as carbon capture and storage devices, oops, sorry. Um, that's what we need to do. Like we have the opportunity to take buildings. We're the only industry that can address climate change by continuing to do what we do. If we, we want to keep building buildings, we need to keep building buildings. And if we can build buildings as carbon capture and storage devices, our industry helps solve climate change and we don't have to stop doing what we're doing. If you're in the oil industry, you're being told to stop doing what you're doing. If you're in all kinds of other industries, 
affected by climate change, you're scared because you have to stop doing what you're doing. We don't have to stop building buildings, we just have to start thinking about our buildings as ways to capture carbon and keep it locked up uh, for the next couple hundred years. And uh, I think that there are lots of strategies for, uh, for being able to do that. And uh, this was short, but I'm glad to sort of talk to anybody about this uh, in more detail, how we do it in our buildings. And